Hey, what's going on? My name is Andrew. You can call me Cookies, and we're going to go over Theater of Pain. Uh, so the first pack we're going to encounter, the Unyielding Contenders is what I'll talk about first. These just cast Death Wish, and it is a soothable debuff. You should be soothing it. But if, for whatever reason, you get this pack pulled with the Raging Bloodhorn, the Bloodhorn takes priority in the Soothe. So the Bloodhorn will cast something called Raging Tantrum. That's right there. If you only have one Soothe in your group, you should be prioritizing Soothing the Bloodhorn and not worry about the Unyielding Contenders. The Unyielding Contenders just get a 20% damage buff to themselves whenever they have this. The Bloodhorn, on the other hand, does a whole bunch of damage to the entire group over the duration of this cast, and it's only interruptible if you Soothe this debuff. So, only Soothe the Contenders if you're pulling them alone or you have extra Soothes to go through. And then in... Our next poll, we have the bosses. So I'll just kind of go over each of the bosses' abilities uh, that are important for healers. So Decia does a lot of damage to the tank through Slam and Mortal Strike, reducing your healing done. And then when she hits 40% health, she's going to enrage and fixate on a random player. I'll fast forward it really quick just to show you that. So, and that just needs to be soothed. It's just like the same idea as like the, the Bloodhorns, so. She's going to hit 40% here, and there she goes. There's a soothable buff, so you want to soothe that as soon as you can. If you don't have a soothe, then the player who's fixated just needs to kite her around the room. And then next we'll talk about Sethel. So Sethel is going to do a bunch of casts, but the only ones that matter are the uh, Searing Death cast. And what those are going to do is uh, debuff a random player. I'll show you it when it does it in a second here. Their cast just went off. You can see it on the mage over here. They have like a little circle around themselves that is pulsing for AoE damage around them. And we just need to heal that. And you can see the mage ticking down here. I am healing them at the very end because I have swift mend and stuff. But basically keep them topped off if you see that debuff on them. And then uh, Passerin. The only thing important about Passerin is if you're a resto shaman. So Passerin... But I guess I'll just mention this still just for groups in general. So Passerin is going to do this thing where he blinks away from the group occasionally. So here, I'll, I'll rewind it again just a little bit just so you see. There, it happened right there. So we'll watch Passerin. He's in the group, and then occasionally he's going to teleport away from the group. When he does that, he needs to be interrupted. And that's so that he comes back in and stacks up with the rest of the, the bosses. So there he teleports to the edge of the room. Someone just needs to interrupt him, so if you're a Resto Shaman, you should just make this your only priority, is interrupting him. Let me close out of my battle net, making noise. Um, so you will interrupt him here, and then he would run back in and stack up on the group. If you don't have an interrupt as a healer, if, if you're not a Resto Shaman, then there's not much you can do about it, but it is nice to be aware of it at least. And then the last thing that we're going to talk about is Zara the Underhanded. So she is a boss that is... Um, you can't do actual damage to her throughout the fight or anything, but you'll see her pop up here on the mage in a second. Just occasionally throughout the fight, it's typically like every 30 or 40 seconds, she's going to ambush somebody and stun them and start dealing a little bit of damage to them. And when that happens, they just, she just needs to be crowd controlled in almost any way. Like almost any crowd control in the entire game works. Uh, me as a wrestler druid, I'm just using Typhoon. So if I see her, you'll see me turn towards her and Typhoon. There it is. And you can use Cyclone, you can use Typhoon, you can use Hex as a Resto Shaman, you can use Capacitator Totem as a Resto Shaman, Holy Paladins can use Hodge and Blind, so on and so forth. You just use any kind of crowd control, and as the healer, again, you should just try to make that one of your priorities, is breaking people out of that, so that the other players in your group don't have to worry about it. And that is the entire boss fight. That's all the important abilities we need to be aware of as a healer. So next up, we will go ahead and go down here to the PvP quarter. I'm not going to go over the level 10 affix or anything. So this pack is not important, but there is one important mob in here that I will mention, which is the Shambling Arbalist. And what they do is they just cast Shoot over and over on random players. You can see there it did a little bit of damage to the Warlock. Obviously on higher keys and on Fortified, it's going to do a lot more damage. And then they also occasionally cast Jagged Quarrel, and that does this exact same thing. It shoots a random player, but instead it puts a bleed on them. So you can see there, I just got a debuff up here, seven seconds remaining, and I'm going to have a bleed for the next seven seconds. 
So heal the players affected by Jagged Coral and keep everybody topped off so that the shoot, just the regular auto attacks from the Arbalist aren't dangerous. Um, and then the other pack where the Arbalist are is all the way down here, so I'll just skip ahead to them. This is the Arbalist pack that's actually dangerous because you have two Arbalists in this pack and they are have they take reduced AoE damage because of the captain being alive. So the, the main thing that you either do is you kill the captain as fast as possible and then kill the Arbalist or you single target the Arbalist since it's only the AoE damage that they're taking less of. But anyways, this is where you're dealing with two of those shoots and Jagged Corals nonstop. So this is where healing cooldowns and keeping the group entirely topped off is very, very important. Um, and then we have these mini bosses here, which I'm not going to go over all the mini bosses. Instead, I'm just going to talk about the abilities that they share that are important for healers. So the first one is Interrupting Roar. They will, there's like a majority of them that do this. When this happens, it's just a bunch of AoE damage for the group. Uh, again, it's going to be low damage because it's a low tyrannical key, but you get the idea. Um, and you just can't be casting at the end of the, the channel. So when they finish that cast, you just don't want to be casting anything. So you can see if I'm in the middle of casting something, I'll stop casting right at the very end. There we go. And it is LOSable. You can LOS this ability the same way that I'm going to talk about the next ability. But I would advise not LOSing the Interrupting Shout. It doesn't do enough damage to like warrant you LOSing or any other players LOSing because you just end up losing more damage than what's actually... like Nothing else dangerous is happening when they do the Interrupting Shout and they don't do any other damage abilities. So the only thing you have to worry about is just getting the group topped off before the next Shout, which is not hard to do. You can almost do it passively. Like here, I'm just doing damage the entire time. I apply like two hots and we're totally fine again. Uh, the only mini boss that is worth talking about as an individual is this one here, uh, Advent Nevermore. So she's going to target people with Ricocheting Throw, which is the other ability that some of the bosses share. And it is right there. It's this red circle around somebody. And that's just going to do, you'll see the Warlock taking a bunch of damage. It's basically a bleed that's on them for a little while. And then in combination with that, sometimes she will do a Seismic Stomp, which is unavoidable AoE damage to the entire group. There it did like no damage at all, but it usually does a pretty sizable chunk. And what I'll talk about here, I don't actually end up doing it during this key. I don't remember why, but when you get Ricocheting Blade, if you're standing here, and it has to be in this spot here, um, or the other side, but it has to be this staircase that I'm looking at right next, right next to me, uh, you can actually duck into here where my mouse is right now, where I'm moving my mouse. You can stand here when she targets you. So she targets you, and then I would run here, and you can line of sight her with this like staircase, and she will cancel the cast when it finishes, and it won't do damage to you. And this is very important to do with the ricocheting blades because they do a lot of damage, and in combination, I mean, like this is a good example here. This is a 16 tyrannical key, so it's not dangerous at all like for my item level and for this group. Um, but she'll combo it with Seismic Stomp here, and you'll see how much damage I take. Like, look how low I get in a plus 16 Tyrannical Key. It's extremely deadly. So, again, make sure you LOS the Ricocheting Blade, but of course you're going to be in Pugs a lot. Like, people are going to be in Pugs, and when that happens, people are going to just eat the Ricocheting Blade a lot of the time. So what you do is you just have to really, really, really heal and top off the player who has the Ricocheting Blade so that they don't die to the Seismic Stomp. And then you just need to AoE heal the group uh, to live through each of the Seismic Stomps. And that's pretty much it for that. Uh, the boss. This boss is really simple. Just do as much damage as you can as a healer. That's my best advice. Um, the only damage that happens in this fight is when... The boss does brutal strikes to the tank, which is like a series of auto attacks right here, brutal combo. So that is kind of deadly to the tank if they're not paying attention, so make sure you just keep them topped off for that. And then other than that, you should only be doing damage to these banners and the boss. Like, you should just focus on damage because that right there, what the boss just did, jumping and slamming on the ground and doing AoE damage to everybody, that's the only damage anyone will ever take. Everything else in this entire fight is completely avoidable damage. So all you need to do is just make sure that you have everyone at full HP again before he does that stomp, which it's a very long time before he does that. It's usually a good like 30 seconds to 40 seconds before he's going to do it again. And then this ends, he's going to spawn another banner. Here it goes. And again, we're just doing damage. We want to help kill that banner as a healer because that banner is more deadly than 
anything else in this fight if that stays alive. And then he's going to jump and slam down, and then all of this stuff is avoidable. There I get hit, unfortunately. But you get the idea. You don't have to focus on healing in this fight. Focus on doing damage. Okay. Uh, next up, we have the Shackled Souls. These You'll usually do these in, like, two pulls. So you'll do two big pulls of these Shackled Souls in most groups. And really all you need to do is keep the group topped off and put a lot of pre-healing into people. If you're not playing it, like if you're playing more of a react healer, then just be ready to use healing cooldowns and whatnot on these because they can be very dangerous. And the best advice I can give is crowd control will do more work than actual healing will. So if you can use AOE stuns, AOE silences, any kind of AOE crowd control that you have to interrupt things is hugely beneficial to keeping people alive during these. And then you'll deal with another pack of them here. This one's kind of the more deadly one. And then after this, you'll pull a Portal Guardian. So what the Portal Guardian does for a healer is he's going to debuff a random player with, um, with I believe it's called Shadow Vulnerability. And I'll just let this play right here so that you can see that. I believe the Warlock gets it here, yep. So there the Warlock gets the Curse debuff. It's a curse, so if you have to dispel you have to dispel a curse, which is Druid or Shaman. If you don't if you're not playing a Druid or a Shaman, hopefully you have a curse to spell in your group. If you don't, pay attention to this debuff and make sure you're tracking it because you need to heal this player a lot and potentially use like healer external and you know damage reduction and stuff like that on that player because they're gonna take a lot of extra damage during this soul storm right here. So, Soul Storm, unavoidable AoE damage to the entire group, so do a lot of AoE healing. Um, and then if that player is still debuffed, you need to make sure that you're healing them a lot. And then we'll skip over this stuff. These guys aren't important. This pull is the other dangerous one with the Portal Guardian, so it's the same things as the Portal Guardian before. Make sure you dispel the curse. That's the most important thing to do. And then because you have a Soul Binder in this pack, what the Soul Binder does is this right here, these, this debuff. You'll see it apply to like random players in the group, and this needs to be dispelled. The curse is more important to dispel, but if you see this, dispel it on cooldown as much as you possibly can, because it's just going to make people take extra damage throughout the, the soul storm and stuff. It's just a damage over time dispellable dot. So you can see here, like I'm going to start taking a ton of damage. So this is a good idea of like using iron bark on myself or using bark skin or dispelling myself. And then if someone else also has a debuff, sometimes you'll get into a, a spot where like two people have the debuff so you need to dispel one person and then really focus healing into the other and then we'll skip ahead here again none of this stuff matters this is another pack very similar to the pack we just talked about just dispel as much as you possibly can on any dispellable debuffs you see and other than that just put a lot of healing into people just don't worry about overhealing just focus on keeping everyone as full hp as possible because there's just a lot of random spikes of damage that can happen if people make mistakes as you're seeing here and now for the boss so i'll just rewind it a little bit so we get a little bit of time to talk about the boss um so the main mechanic for this boss as a healer is going to be uh, Phantasmal Parasite, which is going to apply two debuffs to two random players. There you can see it just went on the Mage and the Warlock. And what we need to do is dispel one player and then really put a lot of healing into the other player. So here I dispel the Mage, and then my goal should just be heal the Warlock as much as possible, but I'm confident that they are going to stay alive and I have Convoke coming up and all that stuff, but you get the idea. Um, I don't actually remember what he... I think he jumped off the edge or something, unfortunately, but... Uh, and then the only other damage people take is from this ability right here, this draw soul ability. So if you see draw soul, just be ready to heal those players. You'll see them get debuffed here. And then the only combo that can happen sometimes, you'll have to kind of learn it for yourself of when it's happening and stuff, but he'll do draw, the boss will do draw soul and then immediately debuff two people right after. So if someone gets draw soul on them and then gets a debuff on them right after, they need to be the priority for dispel because taking both of those debuffs back to back is like very dangerous and deadly so um, also if you're a priest you can mass dispel every other set so you can mass dispel both debuffs off and it just makes this fight a complete joke also if you have a warlock in your group they can dispel but again if you're pugging don't expect it just know that it is possible to do that um, 
And you also have some classes that can dispel themselves, like uh, Monk can use Diffuse Magic, which is like a two minute cooldown to dispel themselves. So see, you can see there that I dispelled the, the tank and then I'm pressing Bark Skin because I have a defensive. So instead of making the tank use something, I'm just gonna dispel him and I'm just gonna use a defensive and then I'm gonna put a bunch of dots or hots on myself and keep myself alive. And it's as simple as that. Dispel one person instantly and then keep the other person alive as best you can with as much healing as possible. Cool. And then the next part that we have is the Gore Chop Quarter, which is actually one of the easier parts of the dungeon. So the first thing we'll talk about is these Putrid Butchers. They're going to cast Chop, and it randomly targets a nearby player in melee range. So typically if you're like a cloth wearer or very squishy or you don't have defenses up, don't stand near the Butchers. So see there it's targeting the Demon Hunter, which is a Havoc Demon Hunter, it's not the tank. You can see him take a chunk of damage, and then for the next like five seconds, he's gonna have this bleed. You can see him ticking down. I'm not actually tracking the bleed debuff, which I should be, but nonetheless, that's the idea. Is just watch out for the chops and see like there it just went on the mage. And on a higher key level, obviously this can do a lot of damage. So you need to keep people topped up and be ready to heal whoever gets targeted by that chop. Um, also, I will mention about the butchers. Uh, there is. I'll go ahead and just fast forward to the next butcher pack. Um, there is another ability that they cast called Devour Flesh, and this needs to be stunned if you can. So as a healer, you can crowd control it, you can stun it. Uh, I don't believe knockbacks work as far as I'm aware. You have to use like hard stuns or single target CC stuff, like right there, Devour Flesh. Uh, so as a druid, I can't really do anything to help unless I took like Mighty Bash, which I do not have it. Um, but essentially what you do is you stun that because if the cast goes off, it does a it doesn't really do that much damage. We don't have to worry about that aspect of it. It just it heals the butcher for a bunch of its HP. So it just makes the, the pull take a lot longer if we're not stunning that. So there it is again, Devour Flesh. You can see it just healed itself for like 10% HP. And it just makes us sit here and like have to fight it for you know longer than we want to. And then the last pack that's important in here is this one right here, which is this uh, Rancid Gas Bag. The little guys we don't have to worry so much about. Whenever they die, they drop a puddle on the floor. Just make sure you're not standing in it. And the Rancid Gas Bag is just going to do constant un unavoidable AoE damage to the whole group. And then he's going to do a frontal and a buntal, which is a frontal from the backside. Um, so you just need to avoid both of those sides. It targets a random player, so he'll kind of like turn in a random direction. And so you just need to be ready to get to wherever his side is and then just heal through this like constant AoE damage. So the AoE damage can actually be... Very, very dangerous, so be aware of that. There's the little circles on the ground that we just got hit by. That's what this debuff is, which is super unfortunate. It is disease dispellable though, so if you're a priest or paladin or monk, you wanna be dispelling those. And that's it for that. Gore chop, keep the tank alive. That That is literally this fight. The tank is going to take a ton of damage from hateful strikes, especially whenever they do not have their defensives available. So use externals on the tank whenever you think they're going to take a pretty heavy hateful strike. You can see it here on the big wigs timers, or you can see the boss cast it. Um, and other than that, you are essentially just avoiding the chain hooks that come down. So you'll see these hooks that come down here in a second across the room, and you're just going to stand in the open section of them. Uh, there is a small tip, which is if you stand close to the boss like this, when he does his pull in, he does like a, an ability where he pulls every single player into him and then does like an AoE slam. So if you're standing right next to him, so there I got pulled, but if I look at a different part of it, when he does the pull, it should be here. Did I miss it? I might have missed it. Maybe it's right here. Yeah, so see there, I didn't get pulled in, but other players did. So if I rewind this just a little bit more. I think we all, okay, we all avoided the pull in. So because we're close enough, if you're like already inside of this circle or even closer, you have to kind of be in his hitbox. Uh, it won't pull you in. So you won't get interrupted and stuff like that if you're a caster. So just as a small tip, just standing next to the boss can help. And then all these... These leftover guys, these ads, they won't jump all over the room and stuff. So I would just advise staying close to the boss as much as you can without being, you know, without putting yourself in like danger or anything, just because it helps keep everything a little together and you don't get thrown around the room and stuff with the pull-in effect. 
here comes the pull-in again, and this time I'm actually going to get pulled, I believe, because I'm all the way out here. So there's the pull-in. Cool. That's that boss. Keep the tank alive. Um, okay, last boss. Uh, first phase is really simple. Just do a lot of damage, and then keep the tank topped off after every... Uh, every Reaping Scythe, that's the big tank hit. It does a lot of damage. And then when the boss hits 50% health, um, these we just heal the group through. It's going to do a little bit of group damage, but again, phase two is where it like really starts to get hectic. And that's at 50% health. The boss is going to do initial AoE damage to everyone. So here, like we're getting the pull in, which is doing damage to us, and this Echoes of Carnage is tr uh, transitioning us into the second phase. But when this cast finishes, we all take a huge burst of damage. So just make sure you have some healing ready to put into the group right away, just so that you're not going into the second phase with, you know, half HP. That way you're kind of ready in, in case someone makes a mistake, because you want to keep everyone topped off during this phase, because there's just a lot of potential for mistakes and people getting hit. So just be aware of that. And really this last phase is a healer. There's nothing too special. It's just dodge stuff. So I'm not going to go over it very much. The only thing I will go over is this right here. When everyone has these circles around them and you're getting pulled into this little vortex, uh, the whole group is going to take a bunch of damage. So this is when I would advise using things like healing cooldowns and really focusing like your attention towards healing rather than doing damage and stuff like that. And that is all of Theater of Pain. So hopefully this video was helpful. It's a little bit different of a format from like my previous at the start of the expansion dungeon guides, but I really wanted to like break in depth how to do each dungeon and just do like a little bit of commentary, but to that's, it's like more, it's like a commentary that's more focused towards like newer players or players who are getting into M plus or trying to learn, you know, the, all the like really important aspects to M plus and the dungeons and all like the little specific details and stuff. So let me know uh, what I could do better for the other dungeons and I'm going to be releasing the other dungeons and stuff like that over the next uh, week or two. So thank you so much for watching and have a good one.